Hello there YouTube, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel. If you haven't already, we have a bunch of great fantasy baseball content and much more to come. I know it's Thursday, but it's Friday on the podcast side, so you know what that means. Alcantara, Soroka, you look so good in Boca. Happy Kokomo Friday and welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on February 24th. Frank Stample joined by Scott White bringing you another mailbag podcast. We'll hit the latest news and notes about all different kinds of information coming in from spring training. Some things that Scott might have to uh, walk away from so he doesn't hear mm. a bunch of your questions as well. Both Apple podcast reviews and emails. Scotty, we have spring training games starting this weekend. Very exciting. What are some things that you pay attention to generally throughout spring training? So I, I guess the simplest way to put it is I pay attention to comments. <laughs> I, I pay attention to what managers and players are saying and what beat writers are reporting on. It's kind of the opposite during the season. Not that those not that those things don't matter during the season. It's just you can tell a lot more from the results themselves themselves. In spring training, the sample is so small and the focus is so different that the stats are mostly meaningless uh, and can lead you down some bad paths. But what is being said about what the players are doing counts for a lot. And it's uh it's caused me to change my thinking on some players heading into the season before in, in ways that have turned out to be quite beneficial. I mean, even just, gosh, a couple years ago, uh, I remember it didn't get a whole lot of attention. Shohei Otani, that was before his big breakout where he emerged as his first round type player. And, and, and one of the things I caught during spring training was Joe Madden um, talking about how uh, how they were going to, they, they wanted to get his bat in the light of as much as possible. Like they weren't going to do the thing they did at the start of his career where they rested him the day before he pitched and the day after he pitches. And I think as early as then Madden was saying, he might even bat him on some days that he pitched. And I don't know, I guess, I guess Shohei Otani was kind of just not top of mind in fantasy for a lot of people at that point. He was still more like a mid round type. So for whatever reason, it didn't get a lot of attention. And I ended up with a lot of, Shohei Otani that year and and obviously it paid off big he won the MVP and everything so that's that's the kind of stuff you look for uh, uh, you know even more so for than than for obvious starters like that um prospects who are trying to break in uh trying to earn a spot on the team players whose roles are in question see if maybe you can get some insight on on what they're looking at role wise heading into the new season. Those are the main things I would say. And I keep a close eye on it every week. I'm going to have a spring training observations article for you to check out. Uh, today I've been working on a, the top 30 position battles. So that's something you can dig into over the weekend. And that'll help steer you more specifically uh, in terms of actual player names and actual situations, things that you should be looking out for. I generally agree that stats don't really matter, Scott, except for position battles, right? Like those are the guys we want to follow and see, all right, well, who's performing better? Who's got a leg up on the competition prospects, which you mentioned, I think it's very smart to pay attention to what, you know, a lot of these young prospects are doing guys like Oswald Peraza. Will he, if he performs well, then he's got a chance to be the starting shortstop for the Yankees or Andrew Painter, if he has a big spring and, he could be in the rotation for the Phillies. So those are uh, a few of the players that I like to look at their spring stats. A few other things for me, Scott. I think playing time for some young players, I want to see that throughout spring training. Lineup spots, 
specifically when we have a full lineup, right? This is more so later on in spring, but you can learn things from that, just seeing where players are batting. I think I saw a, a mock lineup for this weekend that Yoshida for the Red Sox is going to bat cleanup. So, you know, maybe they're kind of experimenting. All right, do we want him to bat cleanup? Do we want him to bat leadoff? So things like mm -hmm. that, uh, velocity with pitch it, with pitchers, new pitches being reported, and obviously injuries. So those are some things that I like to pay attention to as well. Let's get into some news and notes. We mentioned this on our starting pitcher preview part three, but Lance McCullers is dealing with an arm injury and won't be ready for opening day. Scott, how far do you plan to move up Hunter Brown if you maybe you've already done it uh, in your rankings? He's SPARP eligible for CBS, so obviously that matters a lot for heads head points leagues. Yeah, I haven't done it yet. He definitely won't move ahead of Grayson Rodriguez, as we talked about in part three of the pitching preview rather have Rodriguez even knowing that Hunter Brown appears to have a spot Brown has some questions about how consistent of a strike thrower he's going to be I'll move him a lot more in points leagues because of the relief pitcher eligibility but um how about instead of stalling maybe I could give you a a rough idea of where I want to move him I personally like Reed Detmers more and I know Reed Detmers ADP is so low that I might not end up being able to draft Hunter Brown if I rank him behind Detmers, but that's that's kind of where I'm thinking right now. Kind of that Reed Detmers in my own rankings here, John Gray. I'd certainly put Brown ahead of Andrew Heaney. So in, in the 60 to 65 range, it's starting pitcher for me. In terms of relief pitchers, I moved him into a group with Pete Fairbanks, Yoan Duran, and Paul Seawald. Do you think he should be ahead of that group as a relief pitcher? I think that, um, obviously, just for points leagues, mm -hmm. um, that's that's probably about right. So there's little uh, that that's kind of that's kind of a distinction between tiers and my my latest relief pitcher tiers 2.0. I made some some tweaks there, and now I have a tier that includes Ryan Helsley, Camilo Duvall, Clay Holmes, David Bednar. Alexis Diaz and Daniel Bard. It's kind of it's it's the tier of pitchers who seem to be clear closers, but there's still some some small questions about them. And I I think Hunter Brown would slot right behind that tier for me in points leagues, which sounds like about where you have him. Yeah. Okay. So he'd probably be ahead of that group: Fairbanks, Duran, and Seawald. I have him just behind yeah. them for now, but I could see making that adjustment. Jordan Alvarez is not swinging a bat due to left-hand soreness, and last year Alvarez went on the IL with soreness in both hands, though it was listed as right-hand soreness. Scott, any concern? Obviously, this is a late February just soreness for now, but does this worry you with Jordan Alvarez? I mean, I rolled my eyes at it because it's like <laughs> talking him up as a, as a first-rounder, the... Um, you know, the left-handed version of Aaron Judge, basically. I made that case for Jordan Alvarez, and it's just like, he always seems to have something, some nagging physical issue that gives you pause, and this is it. I, I mean, obviously, it didn't hinder his production last year, or maybe it did. I mean, just imagine if it did, what kind of numbers he could have put up. But he put up first-round numbers regardless is the point. So I think I'm just going to keep drafting him as I had been. But if it becomes a bigger issue, the deeper we get into spring training, I may have to reassess. All right, Scott, this is the part of the podcast where maybe you want to go check on the kids, go use the bathroom, change the laundry, something like that. Dodgers prospect Miguel Vargas suffered a hairline fracture in his right pinky and won't swing a bat for a few days. He did play defense in an inter-squad game on Thursday for what it's worth and apparently made a great defensive play. I was reading more about that. So it doesn't seem like a huge deal, Scott, but obviously it's not ideal for one of our favorite sleepers this year. Yeah, and he's supposed to start swinging as soon as he's, as he's able to tolerate it, which could be a matter of days, they've said, which I found a bit surprising, uh, but that is encouraging. What I'm hoping results from this is that it kind of it, it kind of lets some of the helium out of the balloon and I could still get Vargas for the very discounted price that uh, seemed like we were able to get him for a month ago. He's been rapidly rising up draft boards, understandably, because 
it appears he's in line to get the second base job and has a lot of talent. So hopefully this will put the brakes on that a bit and I can still, you know, the, the price doesn't get out of control for him. It doesn't sound like it's going to be a big deal, but it is that sort of thing where if Miguel Vargas, uh, is scuffling this spring or even gets off to a slow start during the regular season that we'll wonder about like, what if they, what if this hadn't happened or what if they had given him more solid time off to, to get healthy? I could see, I could see that becoming a storyline later, but for now I'm not, I'm not going to let it worry me. All right. We've got a bunch of closer news coming in early on in spring training. New Marlins manager, Skip Schumacher indicated that he doesn't plan on using a traditional closer and will instead uh, inst instead <laughs> wow all right <laughs> podcasting during the day this is what happens instead he will play matchups with tanner scott and the team's other high leverage options there's also dylan floro who ended the uh, season last year as the closer matt barnes and recently acquired aj puck do you have a favorite here scott i think puck's the most talented and I, you know, a lot of times managers say this is what my intention is and, and the rubber meets the road and they find out they have to do one way or another. Even they, they either they say they want just one closer and they have to go with a few guys because there's not one who singles himself out. Or in this case, he says he's going to go with a few guys, but um, he really comes to trust one a lot more than the others. And even in situations where they don't have a traditional closer. A lot of times it becomes apparent that the highest lever who, who the highest leverage guy is. And that highest leverage guy is still most often called on in the ninth inning so that more or less he's a closer still. So it's a, it's a messy situation. It's one of like a, a dozen very messy bullpen situations. And I, I wouldn't put it near the top of that list in, in terms of how promising, how much promise there is within the mess. But it does make it unclear who to target. Uh, I kind of get the sense from from reading between the lines with some Marlins beat writers that Matt Barnes might get a stronger look in that role. Uh, he finished strong, of course, and he has closing history, but it's, I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know how motivated I am to target him. I, I just get the feeling that maybe he's beginning to emerge as a favorite. Angels general general manager, Perry Manassian recently expressed optimism that Carlos Estevez will earn the team's closer role this season, though he made it clear the decision will be made by manager Phil Nevin. Uh, Estevez is, career away from Coors Field. Obviously spent his entire career with the Rockies before this on the road. 3.51 ERA, 1.26 whip, 9.5 K per nine, 2.7 walks per nine. Not an elite reliever by any means, but eh, yeah, pretty good numbers. It is, right. it is a little weird how hard they're pushing Carlos Estevez. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's encouraging from the perspective of, okay, at least they're giving us a name, you know? Yeah. But Jimmy Herget seems better than Carlos Estevez. He was the one getting most, the majority of the saves down the stretch for the angels. I don't, I don't know why they want to go with him. He's just so unconventional, Scott. He does not throw hard. He just kind of floats in a breaking ball. It's yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Brad I mean, Ziegler was a good closer for a while. That's true. That is true. You know, I think Matt Moore is a real dark horse here too. I'm just going to continue bringing that name up. He was signed recently by the angels and he was awesome as a reliever with the Rangers last season. So, just a name to remember. Speaking of the Rangers, their new manager, Bruce Bochy, said the team's closer situation is, quote, somewhat fluid, and then mentioned Jose Leclerc's name first among other options. The other options include Joe Barlow, who is working on a new split-finger fastball, Brock Burke, who was great in a multi-inning relief role last year, and Jonathan Hernandez, who had a chance, Scott, and uh, didn't do too well with it. Yeah, I, I found it encouraging that Bochy mentioned Leclerc's names name first and Bochi being more of an old school manager. I think there's a good chance he settles on just one. I'm hopeful it's Leclerc. I do include the Rangers bullpen situation in that group of messy bullpen situations, meaning I wouldn't invest a lot in anybody, mm -hmm. but I think Leclerc is clearly the one to target. 
Brandon Hughes will likely compete with newcomers Brad Boxberger and Michael Fulmer for back-end roles in the Cubs' bullpen. Do you have a favorite there, Scott? Really don't. That is one of the messiest of all. Yep. Uh, Brandon Hughes. If I had to draft one, it would probably be Brandon Hughes, but that isn't based, at, that isn't based on much. All right, Felix Bautista threw a bullpen session without issue on Tuesday. He's being eased in with shoulder and knee issues, so some good news there. Tyrone, Tyrone Taylor is expected to miss two weeks after suffering a right elbow sprain. Scott, you hear that? By God, it's Sal Freelix entrance music. I'm rooting for Sal Freelix, man. I, I think there is, I think there's pretty big upside within this season. Yeah, I mean it's it's like Stephen Kwan upside. That's the easy comparison. Right. So it's it's not like he has early round potential. But someone but that's going outside the top three hundred who could become like a main yeah, lineup. You know? At a position where we have a great need, and of course everybody's interested in in batting average and stolen bases at that point, the at that range uh of the outfielder ranks. So uh I agree. I like South Freak a lot more than I do um uh uh shoot what's his name garrett, garrett mitchell. mitchell yes yeah. gosh man i'm getting toward that age where like you can't <laughs> <laughs> i'm not even 40 yet what am i talking about uh okay yeah i like i like sal free look a lot more than garrett mitchell even though garrett mitchell um got the first crack last year and seems to have a clearer path to playing time this year tyrone taylor doesn't deserve to be a starter i don't think he was he's in he's he's going to be there and in there mainly for defensive reasons, but Freelick wouldn't be a downgrade as far as that goes. With all of that being said, the Brewers then signed Tyler Naquin and Luke Voigt to minor league deals. So we'll see if they yeah. could do anything throughout spring training. Yeah. So like, I w- cause I was putting together this position battle- battles article and I was wondering if I, sh- I should address the Luke Voigt signing in there, but with Jesse Winker, like I don't, I don't see a way they get Jesse Winker, Luke Voigt, and Rowdy Telez in the same lineup. In which case, how do they get Voigt in that lineup? I don't really see it, barring injury. Yeah, he's probably limited to a short side platoon role for now, unless he proves he can do more than that, which, frankly, last year, Luke Voigt was not very good. I brought this up as a possibility during our catcher preview, but Dave Roberts noted Will Smith will not DH quite as much this season because of the J.D. Martinez signing. Last year, Smith played 25 games and saw 108 plate appearances at DH. He did. He did clarify Roberts that he doesn't want to say Will Smith is going to get fewer at bats. Yeah, so. I think it, I think it could even out, Scott. Where maybe Will Smith catches 120 games and DH is 10, something like that. You know. Yeah. Which would bring us pretty close to last year's plate appearance total as well. All right, Scott, once again, you know, go check on the kids, do whatever you want. Alex Kirloff is not is not yet cleared for live batting practice, but has been swinging in the batting cage without issue. So it's a little it's, good. You know, that's more bad. good news than bad. Yeah, potentially. You're, so, you're, spinning, you're spinning all the Kirloff updates in the most negative light, Frank, I have to say. Scott, there was a report like a month ago that said his wrist still hurt. I, I am not lying to you. I can find it for you. I think it was an article on the athletic. Yes. Not making it I, up. It, I think it was, though, he still feels some discomfort in the wrist, but a lot less than he used to pre-surgery. I think that was the report. So, yeah, you could take that negatively, but you could also take it positively. And I think the way it was written, you were intended to take it positively. All right. We all have our guys, Scott. I get it. Stalling Marte took live <laughs> batting practice on field Thursday as he works his ba- way back from groin surgery. Chris Bryant has been a full participant in all activities so far in Rockies camp. Best shape of his life alert. Eloy Jimenez said Wednesday that he dropped 25 to 30 pounds over the offseason. All right, let's 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 see what he could do with it. New pitch alert. Alex Cobb is working on incorporating a cutter and a slider into his pitch mix. Drew Waters is out six weeks with a left oblique strain. Kyle Isbell is expected to start in center field with Edward Olivares and Nate Eaton earning more playing time. I think this is notable, Scott, for their deeper AL only leagues. I've always kind of been interested in Edward Olivares, but the Royals just seem to find any reason to constantly send that guy down. So, yeah, it probably means he's not that good. I, I, I've kind of whenever, over... whenever he's played, he's been pretty good. <laughs> yeah, but. Re- like realistic, like talent wise. I mean, he's been pretty good with a 
260 batting average and 703 OPS and 358 career at bats. Let's not, <laughs> let's not, he's had, he's put up some interesting minor league numbers. I think he had a big spring once and fantasy, the fantasy baseball community got excited about him, but the, the hype just won't die. Even though it's clear, nobody wants anything to do with Edward Olivares except as sort of a, uh, organizational depth role. If he was on any other team, Scott, I would agree with you. But the Royals stink. And I mean, it started with happen. San Diego. That's oh, fair. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, yeah. will they have an opportunity for him? Look, Tyler Gentry needs an opportunity before Edward Olivar Olivares does, okay? We'll see. I, I like Gentry, too. I've drafted him in a few very deep draft and hold leagues, and uh, he was awesome last year. It was at AA. He was also 23 years old, so kind of old for the age. Uh, I'm interested, though. The name there, Tyler Gentry. Unfortunate Guardians prospect news. Daniel Espino has been shut down for eight weeks due to a strain and muscle tear in his right shoulder. Continued injuries with him. He's got electric stuff, but pretty bad news there. And outfield prospect Chase DeLauder, who was drafted last year in the MLB draft, will be sidelined four to five months after undergoing surgery to fix a fractured toe. So some unfortunate news there for the Guardians. Before we hit a break, starting next week, we'll podcast for you. We'll have podcasts for you six days per week, Monday through sun, uh, Saturday. All different discussions. We'll have one live mock draft per week, all bo uh, and a bonus mailbag podcast on Saturday. So make sure you can catch us live on YouTube. That'll be Sunday through Thursday around 10 p.m. Eastern time. We record the night before, and then obviously it drops into your podcast feed the next day. Let's take a break, and we'll be back right after this. What are your thoughts for the future? I helped build the most magical place in the world. What do you say we come in for my close-up now? I only want to be part of something bigger. I made it on my terms, not theirs. Here's the twist. Whoa! I'm in so much trouble, Mandy. It's over. You have no idea what's next. We are going to be more than they ever bargained for. Babylon. Rated R. Now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Follow the path to passion, hope, and history. A tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. Let's get into your Apple Podcast review questions. Thank you all for the five-star rating and reviews from Tiny Tin. Dear Joel, Ellie, and Tess. Oh, man. Uh, it's from The Last of Us. Three oh, characters from the video game The Last of Us. And uh -huh. I guess now the HBO series that I haven't checked out yet. I haven't either. I'm interested. I, I just finished Peaky Blinders. So I think this might be next up. Scott will probably have to wait, you know, a decade before he watches it. So No, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's just a one season thing, right? It's one it, and done. I have, I have no idea. I need to do my research, but okay, I, yeah, I've, I've heard very good things. I, I don't like watching shows until they're over or you know in their last season. That's what Frank is referring to for people who haven't been listening a long time. My five by five categories league uses quality starts and saves plus holds instead of wins and saves. Can you talk about some of the biggest winners and losers with these changes? P.S. My nephew Mark has a birthday coming up and loves the show. Can you give him a shout out? Well, happy birthday, Mark. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you for listening and loving the show. But let's get back to the question here, Scott. So saves plus holds, I think it's kind of a cop-out, Scott. I get why people do it. It's like saves are such a headache and teams rare. Like not every team uses a traditional closer anymore. But it does allow you to just draft the, the most skilled reliever, which I think is the point of fantasy baseball, just drafting the best skilled players. Uh, so what I like to do there is you just target relievers on the best teams that have good ratios, get you strikeouts, but I don't think that you should overemphasize like the top end save leaders or anything like that. I, I think there are a lot of names that you could find either throughout your draft or, or throughout the season. Oh yeah. During the season. Yeah. That's the thing. Like it, it, it completely, it completely transforms my approach to relief pitcher. I, I mean, I, I say this based on the one or two of these that we, we, I played in before saves plus old leagues. We did change the podcast for the people league, which already has some weird rules. We, we did change that from saves to save plus holds last year, just so I could speak about it with more authority, but having experienced that now, like just let everybody else pay for relievers. Cause there are going to be saves plus holds guides emerging all year long. 
and uh, there's no reason to pay for them. So that would be the biggest change as far as using quality starts instead of wins. I think that's uh, I think that's much less of a change. As we talked about in the pitching preview podcast, I'm already inclined to uh, value pitchers who are capable of six plus innings with regularity. I'm already inclined to value them much more than ones who don't do that regularly, ones I don't trust to do that regularly, precisely because of the win potential. And obviously, six innings is the minimum required for a quality start, so it it, it, it has even a, a more direct correlation to that. So I would say just lean into that tendency that I'm already inclined to lean into even harder. And, quality- and, and you know, you could look at... you. Could, I guess pitchers on bad teams would have like pitchers who fit that description on bad teams would have more value than, than they do in traditional win leagues. That would be another factor to consider. Uh, but that, that only, that only uh, includes a handful of guys. I would think mm-hmm. quality start leaders from last season, from Valdez, Alec Manoa, you Darvish, Sandy Alcantara, Shane Bieber, Martin Perez, miles, Michaelis, Corbin Burns, Garrett Cole, Justin Verlander, Joe Musgrove, and Max Fried. Names that are lower on the quality start list than you might expect. Uh, Blake Snell, and lots of five-inning starts in there. Luis Garcia with the Houston Astros, Drew Rasmussen, and of course, my boy, Jeffrey Springs. <laughs> How many quality starts did Jeffrey Springs have last year? Oh, geez. It, did you? It could not have been many. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. He had six. Okay. I think he only went six innings either six or seven times. So <laughs> almost all of them were quality starts. Uh, I, did, yeah. I have one more note on saves plus holds. The breakdown of saves versus holds is very interesting. AJ Minter was the leader last year with 34 holds. The saves leader was Emmanuel Class A with 42. Um, there was two relievers with 40 plus saves. There was only one reliever with 30 or more holds. And again, that was AJ Minter. But there are a lot more pitchers who get 20 and 10 holds than there are yeah. saves. So I would rather have like three free holds guys than yeah. two expensive saves guys, you know? For sure. Yeah. There were 21 relievers with 20 plus holds, 91 with 10 plus holds. Last year, there was only 35 pitchers with 10 plus saves. So think about that difference. 91 versus 35. So again, 10 and 20 plus range of holds. A lot easier to find that than it is to find saves. This next one's from The Gambling. Wanted to get your takes on older guys. Oh, well, this is perfect for Scott. Older guys like Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander from Scherzer's IL stints. And both of them climbing in age. Do you take the risk or do you go with a young gun like Alec Manoa? Dylan Cease, Luis Castillo, etc. To gambling, I thank you for your five star review. I get the impression, though, you're not someone who listens to the podcast very often. Because <laughs> if you were, you would know that my top two pitchers in 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 uh, my five by five rankings and numbers two and three in head head points leagues are Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer. So they're not even in the same discussion for me as guys like Alec Manoa, Dylan Cease, and Luis Castillo. Even though ADP shows that they are, I think they're being highly undervalued because of their age, which, as I've mentioned quite a few times, I don't see that number as a, as a particularly big risk factor for starting pitchers in particular. In part because there are just so many risk factors for pitchers that just seems like a a chintzy one and in part because the fact that they're older means that they've shown this ability to take on workload time and time again. Um, and, and that's the biggest question for the young guys is can they repeat those big workloads over and over again? Well, we already know Verlander and Scherzer do so big question answered. Yes. Scherzer has missed some time in recent years with injuries, but they, I, I don't think a single one of them was arm related. It's been like back stuff and neck stuff and oblique and, you know, maybe it does show that his, his, uh, his body is not rebounding as well as it used to. Don't want to completely dismiss it, but it's not, it's not the kind of injuries that would normally concern you about a pitcher and his ability to stay healthy. All right. This next one's from our gen RNFJ. Interesting. 10-team keeper league. 
categories with OBP. Who are you taking in the second round? Bo Bichette, Bobby Witt Jr., or Mookie Betts? I think we have the same uh, answer. What was that? I think we have the same answer. Oh, yeah, Betts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, I don't know. Yeah, you probably can get him in like the early second round in a 10 team league. So, yeah, you'll, the, be, you'll be kind of lucky. You'll be kind of lucky too. Yeah, he's probably going towards the end of the first. But either way, if you're just deciding between those three names in a vacuum, I think it's Mookie Betts for each of us. And I'm willing to wager it's Mookie Betts for Chris as well. In a 10 team OBP league, I'm not even sure Bichette and Witt are second rounders. That's fair. Like, Betts is arguably a first rounder. Bichette and Witt are like, Maybe maybe Bichette's a third rounder and Witt's a fourth, fifth rounder. I don't know. In an OBP league, we're talking a shallow OBP league. Mm -hmm. Bobby Witt Jr.'s OBP last year was 294. So yeah, yeah, uh, I get it. He's gonna give you gonna give you the little bit of power, a lot of speed, hopefully. Uh, but the OBP is quite bad. And then Bo Bichette was at 333. He's helped out because his batting average is so good, but he doesn't really walk very much. This one's from Small Beefy Baseball Boy. Nice. Yeah, I guess we don't really show those a lot of uh, a lot of love. I don't even know who would be a small, beefy baseball boy. Yeah, that's what I don't. I don't really like a short guy who have who's, like a short know, beefy. I mean, like Alejandro Kirk or Kirk is. Yeah, he's he's short and he's a little stocky. Now, I was thinking like, of I, big. I don't I don't know that that's so much related to height. It's just size regardless. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe this is kind of a contradiction here. I thought of Corbin like, Carroll too, just because like he's jacked and he's small, but he's not, you know. Yeah, kind of like a lean, lean and muscular. Yeah, he's he's pretty jacked up, but he's small. He's yeah. like five ten or something like that. I have the first overall pick in a ten team head to head categories draft with daily lineups. Should I pick Otani because he's like two players in one, or go with Aaron Judge? Scott, I know you uh, love Aaron Judge, but. This, yeah, this will test the limits. No, I mean, if 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 you can change your lineup daily, I don't even care what the scoring format is. You have to go with Otani because you're getting an ace and a stud bat. It's just it's no need to overthink that one. But that's yeah. all that only goes for leagues that you can change your lineup daily, which we don't typically cater to at CBS. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't mean we won't. But yeah, I mean, obviously, we try to work it in, but right. it's, it's not the focus I, of our analysis. I, I'm just right. I, I'm just clarifying for the people. Why, why don't you ever talk about Otani as the number one overall pick? Well, that that's why we're usually yeah. we're usually thinking in terms of weekly leagues. For sure. Yeah. And we've re received this a form of this question a lot recently. I was looking through the the email inbox and, and a lot of daily lineup league. Are you sure Otani is number one? Yes. One thousand percent. If you play in a daily lineup league where you can reap all of Otani's benefits, use him as a hitter, use him as a pitcher, and he's only one player, he is the number one player. There is no doubt in my mind. This one is from CDM083, 10-team keeper league. Need to keep five of the following players. This is another one of those uh, humble brags, Scott. Freddie Freeman, Ronald Acuna, Julio Rodriguez, Pete Alonzo, Aaron Judge. How did you get all these players? Michael Harris, Corbin Burns, Sandy Alcantara, Jacob DeGrom, and Framber Valdez. Only five. Uh, he doesn't specify whether it's points or categories, does, does he? Not. Nope. Okay, so definitely Judge, J-Rod, Acuna, uh, Freeman, I would say. And then it comes down to Alonzo and Alcantara, I think, depending on the scoring format. Uh, I would, well, I mean, I guess you could, I guess you could consider. Okay, so if it's a points league, definitely Alcantara is the fifth keeper for me because of all those points he gets on the innings. If it's a categories league, you could debate uh, Alonzo and Burns. As much as I want to load up on hitting. I guess I guess the value of Burns would be too good to pass up. Scott, you've already and, got four first round players on your exactly. team. I think you could take one elite pitcher. <laughs> yeah. Fair yeah enough. I'm taking Corbin Burns, regardless of the format. So the top four you said, and then Corbin Burns for me. This one's from JR0, 12 team head to head category, salary cap slash auction league with $260 budget. Keep three. Manny Machado for 31. Starting pitcher Otani for 19. Dylan Cease for 14, Dalton Varsho for 11, Adley Rutschman for seven, and Willie Adamas for six. 
Does not say if it's a two catcher league or not, but head to head categories, I would assume it's one. Yeah. I think I would keep Machado for 31, Cease for 14, and Varsho for 11. They're all good choices, though. Yeah, they are. I actually have Otani ranked ahead of Cease just as a pitcher. But he's $5. $5 yeah, yeah, it's close enough where I probably would just take the savings. So I yeah. could keep both if you wanted to give back Varsho, but I think $11 for a, a potential 2020 catcher is probably too good to pass up. Yeah. And it's tough because we both like Willie Adamas too, but shortstop is deep. Eh, you want to keep the elite third baseman with Machado. I think I agree, Scott. Machado, Cease, and uh, Dalton Varsho. This one's from Kevy Reeds. Head-to-head categories league. Pick four. Trey Turner in the first. Vlad Jr. in the second. J-Rod in the seventh. Wander Franco in the ninth. And George Kirby in the 21st. Also adds in that he doesn't think the teams ahead of him will keep players in the first round. So there's a chance that Turner makes it to him with the fourth overall pick. Hmm interesting but hmm somebody better than turner might make it to you with the fourth pick if that's the case plus like j-ram you, could make it to you with the fourth pick do you want to keep trey turner and wander franco i mean that's another conversation with well him. i mean just talking values because i assume we have to keep four yeah it's four um but like could you keep fewer than four and just have an extra pick because i i don't feel like wander franco in the ninth round is really a discount worth, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess he could go in round eight instead of round nine. Yeah. It, I'm just not that impressed by the value there. George Kirby, 21. Okay. That's a value. J rod in round seven, obviously uh, Vlad in round two. Again, that's kind of iffy. I lean yes on it. So those three, I feel pretty solid about. It's just Trey Turner in round one based on what, like, Without that additional context of you don't think people are going to keep a lot of first rounders, Trey Turner in round one would be the fourth choice for me. But knowing you could maybe get somebody I like even more than Turner, because Turner's like my sixth ranked player. Yeah, you uh, might be able to get Judge player. or Jose Ramirez, you know? Right. Then I guess Wander Franco in round nine would be the fourth. I, I guess that's fine. Yeah, I think given the context, I'm all right throwing Trey Turner back and seeing who makes it to me at four. This one's from Sean Black, 72. I played in a 5x5 five five categories league with middle infielder, corner infielder, and five outfielders. Should I be concerned with position scarcity? <laughs> this is another one, Scott. <laughs> right up your alley. Probably no if you've been listening, but uh, take. should I be concerned with position scarcity and take outfielder in round two and round three, like Scott suggests, or take the best player available? With my utility spot, corner, and middle, I could field three third basemen or three first basemen or even three shortstops. And I've seen YouTube chat, chats and, and comments, Scott, kind of bringing this up that the possibility, are you going too far with the position scarcity? So obviously, like, you can answer a question like that. Like, you have Rafael Devers as a first-round pick. I was looking at ADP earlier today. His ADP is 20, right? So that means he's a late second-rounder. Are you passing up on more assured stats or players like a uh, Freddie Freeman or Mookie Betts just to shore up third base? And I have heard other people a ask a question like that. So what would be your response? Uh, no, not in that case. I, I mean, I understand why they're asking. I'm stressing it hard because I think people are going to underestimate the importance of it. So it's natural that people who are inclined to underestimate the importance of it from my perspective are going to accuse me of overestimating the importance of it. That's just, that seems like a natural development. Uh, but I think they're wrong. There is a point where you can overvalue it. I don't think saying, okay, Raphael Devers and Freddie Freeman, they're going to they're likely to provide stats that are pretty similar. Maybe Freeman's a safer bet for batting average. Maybe Devers is a safer bet for home runs. But the overall expectations for stat line with them is, is not that far apart. So obviously I'm going to take the player at the weaker position. Um, now to address this question specifically, it's, it's kind of a weird situation because yes, I think it's very important to fill outfield early. 
but he's talking about round two and round three specifically. The best round to draft an outfielder in is round one because seven of them go there and they all deserve to go there. Round two is kind of, I don't know. It's kind of like a, a, a hole in round two and round three at that position. Mike Trout in round two. Okay. That that's fine. Um, you could talk about like Fernando Tatis when he comes back. It, it sounds like he's going to, we, we didn't talk about this uh, in the outfield preview, but it sounds like Fernando Tatis is going to be primarily an outfielder when he comes back. He won't have eligibility right away. You can't draft him to fill that spot immediately. Uh, but you can draft him thinking of him as an outfielder. And then in round three, it's like Michael Harris, who I'm not saying I absolutely want to take, but we all have concerns about Michael Harris. So because you're you're asking about round two and round three specifically, uh, broad, your broad question, should you prioritize outfield early? Yes, but round two and round three specifically, it's hard to get an outfielder worth taking there. Um, round four, it starts to look interesting again with players like Kyle Schwarber and who's another fourth round outfielder, Frank? Um, Adolis Garcia came to mind, but I know that you don't like him. That's too early. Come on. Probably too early for him. Austin. Randy Arosa Reina, I guess. Luis C Robert. Cedric Mullins. Yeah. I mean, that that's the time to start thinking about outfield again. My favorite of them is Schwarber. Mm -hmm. You don't mention what's going on with you in round one, whether they're keepers or you just have something you know for sure you're going to do in round one that doesn't involve taking an outfielder. I don't know. But like round one is the round where I want to get an outfielder. Unless I get Jose Ramirez. All right. This next one is from Hot Pie 865 Dear Harry, Ron, Pat, and Boog. Or Boog. I think, uh, I think seeing Harry and Ron, our first thought will be Harry Potter. But I think these are Cubs broadcasters. Boog Shambi. And then, I don't know. I assume the other ones are, are uh, Cubs broadcasters at some point. Hmm. I'm sure Cubs fans everywhere are yelling at the podcast right now. What are you? You don't know the Cubs broadcasters. Any Shambi does Cubs games now? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 12 team, five by five categories league. Which two of the following should I keep? Otani, pitcher only, JT Real Muto, Yu Darvish, George Springer, Alex Bregman, Jose Abreu, and Christian Javier. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, which two should you keep? Okay, I guess Real Muto. I'm not thrilled about investing that much in catcher, but he's he's clearly the best player here. Uh, and apart from him, do you take Otani the pitcher? I was gonna say, do you take Bregman just to get the third baseman, Scott? No, I th see that that I think is going too far. Might be when it you're giving be. up a. a fourth, fifth round caliber pitcher for a seventh round bat. Yeah. So the two to keep are real Muto and Otani. All right. We're going to take the pitcher, the pitcher Otani. <laughs> yes. But well, we're going to take one more break and we'll be back right after this. There's something coming. Let's face it together. Engage. Your crew and a part of you. They lift you up to accomplish the things you never could do alone together you are never without hope italy's best clubs and brightest stars bring show-stopping skills and unbelievable thrills in the fight to the finish for the scudetto stream every stereo match live on paramount plus Welcome back into Fantasy Baseball today. We do have more of your Apple Podcast review questions. I do appreciate all of them, but I want to get to some emails as well. So we're going to save the rest of these APR for next week. And let's get to some emails, which you can send us at fantasybaseball at cbsi.com. That's the letter I. This one's from Alexander, Dear Henley, Brew, and Motley. Cruz? Different C R E U E W Cruz? Like that Motley Crew, right. Brew Crew. I don't know yeah. what Henley Crew is, but is that a person? I don't know. Henley Crew? Is that like a type of shirt? Like a Henley with like three buttons up here and crew neck? I don't know. But I think 
yeah, I think you're on right. the same, Scott. I think that makes sense. Five by five standard roto, 10 to 12 teamer. Well, which one is it? 10 or 12? Three keepers, two uh, set, but third is an uncertain choice right now. Rafael Devers in the second, Luis Castillo in the 12th, Luis Severino in the 20th. I'm keeping Kyle Tucker in the 13th and J-Rod in the 14th, so outfield is not a concern, but third base is because of the cliff and where I draft. I think this is a really interesting question, Scott, because it really tests the limits of how much do you value position scarcity and an elite hitter early on versus the late round value that you can get from a keeper later on in your draft. Yeah, I valued a lot. I take Devers in round two. Uh, Luis Castillo in round 12 is is almost tempting enough to, to hesitate. Severino in round 20 really isn't. I mean, Severino gets drafted much earlier than round 20. Yeah. But it's... He's he's drafted more in a range where expectations are, uh, you know, that you're you're just you're just you're just understanding that pick is a lot like more likely to go wrong. So picking up a few rounds doesn't make a huge difference to me. There, yeah, I definitely keep Devers in round two. This email is from Brian. Where would you rank Jeffrey Springs amongst the relief pitchers? As he is eligible as one in my league. Ross Stripling is as well, but not sure how the Giants will use him. Stripling is going to be a starting pitcher. So if he has relief pitcher eligibility, I don't know if this is ESPN or Yahoo, whatever it might be. Yeah, I mean, those guys definitely pick up some more value here, Scott. I'm eyeballing your rankings right now. Maybe Springs kind of moves into like that Ryan Helsley, Camilo Doval kind of range. What do you think about that? Is that too high for Springs? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's about right. That's about right. Okay. And then Ross Stripling, I assume, would be a little bit later than that. So maybe similar to what we said about Hunter Brown earlier, where once you get past like David Bednar, Alexis Diaz, David Bednar, I just said David Bednar twice. Daniel Bard is who I wanted <laughs> to say. I am losing it, man. Um, and we're not even in, uh, at March yet. I think right after that group of like closers, I feel pretty good about their job security. Like maybe Ross Stripling would slot somewhere in there. Yeah, I'd put him behind Hunter Brown. Okay. But he definitely deserves to. I, I presume this is a points league. There's not much reason for asking otherwise. And I definitely, in that scenario where Stripling has RP eligibility and it's a points league, definitely want to draft him. Uh, but it can be later. I know there are head to head categories leagues where. You can, I guess Sparps would be eligible too, where you have like two starting pitcher spots, two relief pitcher spots, and then just three pitcher spots. But yeah. you're right. I mean, it's more there, there are scenarios where you might want to use him in an RP spot, but like you need saves too. So you're yeah. kind of blowing your chance to get more of those if you do that. This next one's from Andrew. Went to a candy store that had double hot chocolate peeps. I am on Scott's side with peeps, but not sure if that. If that is a flavor I can get behind, has Scott ever tried this flavor? And what are the top three peeps flavors according to Scott? I mean, I don't do the whole flavors thing. <laughs> uh, I I don't eat that many peeps. First of all, I just think look at the size I, of I, Scott. If he ate I peeps think, every day, I think he'd be a little bigger. <laughs> I think uh, I, I just think the um, the hate directed toward peace, peace toward <laughs> peeps. Feels very recent, feels very social media driven, and feels inauthentic to me. And people are being ridiculous. That's that's my true stance on Peeps. It's a sugar covered marshmallow, whatever. It's fine. Get over it. I have tried the um, the hot tamales Peeps. You know the candy <laughs> hot tamales, the same company that makes Mike and Ike. They have a cinnamon flavored. Interesting. And I, that's what that's just one of my favorite candies, period. And so, you know, you get that, you infuse that flavor in with the peep. And it's very good. I like that more than the original peep, I would say. But I, I haven't tried much otherwise, just original and and the hot tamales peeps. And uh I like them both. Uh I, I agree though, I've seen some of these peeps that are like dipped in chocolate and stuff. If it's something like that, like that just seems I'm sure, I'm sure it's fine if you like it. I'm not going to give you grief over it, but it, it doesn't seem necessary. Yeah, I mean, they have some they have some pretty crazy flavors that I'm looking at here. One one of them is like part cake. One of them is strawberry shortcake. 
fruit punch. <laughs> They're getting pretty crazy with these peeps flavors. Sweet lemonade. Uh, yeah. All right. Look, Easter's coming. I know a lot of people like to fill their baskets with uh, with with the peeps. So hey, it's it's relevant this time of year, Scott. We've got to know. We need all the answers. Keeper question: Twelve team head head categories auction draft. Basically, points league roster size: three outfielders, no corner or middle, etc. It is six by six. Uh, categories, normal roto, but add walks for hitting and losses for pitching. Daily lineups, so pitching, you risk it for streaming. Uh, for weeks, the crew had a great discussion uh, four weeks ago. The crew had a great discussion on the auction Motley drafting. Crew. Yeah, the Motley crew. Uh, auction drafting and how it factored and what that does for middle-tier talent typically being raised during the draft, which brings that question of who I should keep up to four. Uh, two of the four are locks, so there are two for three spots. He's got J-Rod and Vlad for $1 each, obviously. Shane O'Mac, Shane McClanahan for $29. Bucks, Luis Castillo for 13 and Framber Valdez for one. Yeah, I keep the cheaper guys in this case. Framber Valdez for one, easily. Yeah, I think he's in the same tier as Luis Castillo. But even uh, Castillo for 13 I like more than... than um, Shane McClanahan for 29. I don't think there's a huge difference in my expectations for them. I do have McClanahan a tier higher. I think technically two tiers higher, but you're talking about more than double the price. And Castillo, I still see him as a high end arm. So I think, I, I don't think McClanahan's worth the, the upcharge in this case. All right. This next one's from Mick. Ever since Frank Menachino was hired as the hitting coach for the White Sox, he has expressed his hatred for home runs favoring a more contact-oriented approach, leading to disappointing seasons for most White Sox hitters. With new management and new coaches this year for the White Sox, do you find yourself buying bounce-back seasons for guys like Luis Robert or Andrew Vaughn or even Jose Abreu now that he is on the Astros? And I've seen this reported, Scott. I've heard other people talk about it. I think it's a really fair conversation to have. Last year, the White Sox were seventh in strikeout rate, so clearly put an emphasis on making contact, but they were just... 26th in ISO, which is isolated power. You can find it on fan graphs, slugging percentage minus batting average. It's just basically a uh, tell-all power statistic. Um, the White Sox this offseason brought in Jose Castro as their hitting coach and former player Chris Johnson as their assistant hitting coach. Castro spent 24 seasons as a hitting coordinator in the minors and most recently eight seasons with the Atlanta Braves as their assistant hitting coach. So... What do you think, Scott? I think this is a pretty interesting theory that maybe we can get guys like Luis Robert and Andrew Vaughn a little bit more pop this season. Well, I hadn't heard about any of this before, but it's it's interesting because Pedro Grafol is the White Sox new manager. And if I have him right, and I hope I'm not misattributing this, but this was a storyline for the Royals uh, back when like Eric Hosmer and Mike Moustakis were first coming up and Pedro Grifol had the same issue where he was emphasis, like he wanted them to be contact hitters, you know, want them to be power hitters and, and people were stressed about it. They thought he, he had uh, uh, interfered with those emerging talents growth. You know, he, he, he messed up their development. People blame him for that. Now he's the manager of the team that you're saying the hitting coach did the same thing with last year. So it's it's that that's that's been my connotation with Pe Pedro Grifol ever since. Um, so I wonder if it's going to improve that much now that he's the manager. But putting that aside, uh, I, I could see if 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 that's not an issue and the hit the hitting coach is the one calling the shots and he doesn't feel the same way, then I, I don't know. It could make a difference. I do wonder. Like, I don't really understand the relationship between a hitting coach and a player. What I mean by that is, is it more like a military situation where the player has to follow the hitting coach's orders? I don't think so. I think it's more the hitting coach has to sell the player on the changes, and if the player is sold on the changes, he applies them. And if the player is not doesn't apply them and doesn't perform then yeah he could potentially lose his job but if he does perform i don't think whether or not 
he follows the hitting coach's advice is going to make a difference. So like, I, I think it ultimately comes down to what the player wants to do. Right. Like, I don't think it's like, Oh, it's insubordination because you didn't do whatever. I could be wrong. I, I don't know clubhouse dynamics well enough, mm-hmm. but like they're grown men and they have more at stake in their career than the hitting coach does. And the hitting coach might not be long for that job anyway. So if you don't buy what he's selling, just don't do it. That is what I assume the relationship is like, but I could be completely wrong about that. So I, what I'm, what I mean, so what I'm trying to say is I'm not sure that all the, all the numbers you're looking at has everything to do with the hitting coach, because if the players don't think it's working, why would they keep doing what he says? I think that's fair, Scott, but I I also think there is something to, we kind of saw it widespread on the White Sox last year, right? Where Jose Abreu power was down, Luis Robert power was down. I I mean, there could just be legitimate reasons for that. Luis Robert, maybe he was playing hurt, obviously missed a lot of time due to injury. Jose Abreu getting a little bit older. I mean, it could just be coincidence, but it also wouldn't shock me. It it, kind of makes sense that, you know, maybe they put an emphasis on that approach. So uh, either way, I think the White Sox hitters are talented enough where their power should bounce back regardless, whether you want to buy into this theory or not. So that's that's basically the main point there uh, for the White Sox. And Scott, we'll wrap up with this. Uh, a comment from YouTube. Peeps equals pitch clock. Pure garbage. <laughs> I'm sorry, Scott. Would you wow. like to respond? <laughs> um, I think you're going to be surprised the effect the pitching clock has on your enjoyment of the game. Not so much the pitching clock. Oh, I love the pitching clock, but how much it speeds up the action. I think you're going to enjoy watching baseball more because of the pitching clock, whether you recognize that it's because of the pitching clock or not. I agree completely, Scott. I mean, if we can get games under three hours, (laughs) that sounds totally fine to me, which means we could also maybe start the podcast a little bit earlier at night during the season. So I'm all for it. Let's, let's make the games go a little bit faster. We're going to wrap there for Scott. I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching this mailbag edition of fantasy baseball today. We'll be back back again next week. Wait, 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 I wanted to click. I wanted to click, correct the record on Pedro Grafol. Okay. Cause I have slandered him. Uh Oh, so he was the one brought in with George Brett to correct the mistakes of the previous hitting coach. Pedro Grafol is now doing the same thing for the White Sox. He is not the problem. He is the solution. Let's go. Give us all the power, baby. Luis Robert, 30 home runs. Let's get it. For Scott, I'm Frank. We're going to wrap there. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.